Hey guys, welcome to the Fieldcraft Survival Podcast. We got a good one lined up for you today. But before we get started, we got to recognize our sponsors. You know, we got a lot of friends in this business, a lot of folks in the firearms industry, a lot of folks in the clothing industry and all that great stuff. Um, and they make this podcast totally possible. So I want to just jump right into this because I know you're anxious to hear who we got on board. And the first sponsor I'm going to recommend you guys pay attention to and hopefully visit and you know buy from is Sig Sauer. Guys, Sig Sauer and the Sig Sauer Academy, what can I say? I grew up in New England. I travel to the Sig Sauer Academy all the time. I carried SIGs all over the place. I carried a 220 10 mil in Alaska. Um, I carried a 226 for a while in my early 20s. And uh, currently I'm going back and forth between a 320 X carry full size and a P365 that started off its life as a standard P365 with like a 10 and a 12 round mag. Now it's the XL grip and my buddy Cav uh, recently hooked me up with an XL slide. So the 365, I swear to God, is one of those guns that like you just need to have at least one. Same thing with the 320 because you can modify it pretty much to whatever you want. Um, and now I got word that I might be even get my hands on one of those 10 mils, which is pretty sick. I love the 10 millimeter. It's one of those rounds that has all the millimeters. And if you can find some of the original hot rounds that are loaded to the original specs, mother of God, that is a potent black bear dangerous game round. So guys, please check out Sig Sauer. Please check out the Sig Sauer Academy. When you go up there, take a look at the new Sig Experience Center. It should be opening up. Uh, I think you're really going to enjoy everything about that whole experience. Uh, please stay at the Exeter Inn if you go up there and check out Goody Coles. Those are my two recommendations for a place to stay and a place to eat if you go up there. Second company I want to bring your attention to are the good folks over at Black Rifle Coffee. And if you use the coupon code CRAFT15, that'll get you uh, a discount when you check out. Certain things aren't going to be on that discount. It is what it is. Um, but you will find that it's going to work with uh, a lot of the ground coffees and a lot of the instant coffees and things like that. Evan and the guys over in Salt Lake City, they've hosted us a bunch of times. We've hosted them. I mean, on our Sprinter van, if you guys ever see us on the road, big green Mercedes van with black rifle coffee on the side, honk at us, wave at us, don't wave anything at us. And if you find us at a gas station, see if we have any of those ready to drink cans, which we probably do, and we'll give you one. So please use that coupon code CRAFT15, and that will get you a discount when you check out at Black Rifle Coffee. And uh, if you guys haven't tried our new Fieldcraft Endurance Blend, please do so. I mean, right now, Shackleton is so hot, right? I mean, that's what everyone is talking about, the whole Shackleton uh, endurance ship being found and being preserved all those years. Well, drink a cup of coffee, read up on it. It's an awesome story, and it's even better coffee. All right, guys, <clears throat> like I said, I'm not going to waste too much of your time here. Please check out our good friends over at Sig Sauer and Black Rifle Coffee, and let's give this podcast a listen. Here we go. Jeff, thanks for making the trip out here, man. Of course, dude. Happy to do it. Your weather was perfect for a flight in and a drive over the mountain. Well, I, I always think, oh, it's Colorado. You're just going to drive. But that's like 12 hours of drive. So it would have been nine, nine from the ranch to here. Yeah. So I might have saved three hours on each side. Yeah. But the storm, I mean, we're sitting on a storm right now. Mm -hmm. It just dropped a whole bunch of snow in California. And now we're getting it. And I just looked outside the window um, making your, your coffee upstairs. And it's starting to come down right now. Yeah. And you'll get a dozen accidents from new drivers figuring it out for the first time. Yeah, they're remembering. Yeah. <laughs> um, so if you guys don't know Jeff, we've we've kind of teased out Jeff over Philcraft survival uh content um in in various form factors. But we did film a frontier episode with you, right? Not yet. Oh, we have it booked. <laughs> we ran out of green weather and cattle on pasture That's because right. of the winter. So. That's right. We have a booked Phil Craft Frontier episode coming with you, which I'd like to do um, right after this podcast is released and doing the winter, the things that you deal with winter-wise hmm. um, with these issues. In, in fact, perfect content. John, make a note. Um, in January, um, having the opportunity to go out my scout camper and – uh, camp out in the scout camper on the ranch, but seeing how 
cattle ranchers like yourself, owners like yourself, go through harsh winters mm -hmm. in Colorado. That'd be cool content. Yeah, I'm down. Yeah, it'd be cool. I'm, I mean, the, the harshness of the winter is usually three days at a time of nasty weather, and then it gets mild, and that's the benefit of where we live compared to you know some of the ranchers in Montana. Yeah. Um, so usually ours is a little cyclical, mm -hmm. um, which actually from a health standpoint for cattle isn't ideal. Yeah. Because their respiratory health will start to diminish when it when it gets warm and cold all the time. So there's a lot of weather externalities that cause issues like that. So that's one of the biggest challenges we have. Ah, interesting. Yeah. And we'll catch uh, capture all of that uh, on film, uh, like we did with uh, Little Belt Cattle Co. and some of the other guys that we're highlighting in this thing we call Frontier, which is us keeping cattle ranchers and I think the 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 fabric, the foundation of American culture, but also substance for Americans on the forefront of your mind and educating and all those things. Uh, that's one of the reasons I brought uh, uh, Jeff on the podcast. Jeff brought me a gift, Colorado Craft uh, Beef. You guys were established in 1917, a little uh, present, but I want to do an unboxing for you guys just to make you jealous. Do you guys offer these for sale? We your? do. Oh, That is the small summer sausage gift box. So we do a ton of those during the holidays, great holiday gifts. Or we just have people that love to stock them. So that is a seasoning packet from Bam. one of our local seasoning suppliers in Sterling uh, nearby. Just a little info card. Info card. That's really cool. And then I got three, what do you call them, logs? Yeah. Three of the small summer sausages. Three of the small ones. And this is uh, beef summer sausage. It's going to be the original. There should be a jalapeno in there somewhere. Yep. Original and the third one should be jalapeno. Yeah, beef jalapeno summer sauces with cheese. There it is. So, so um, cattle rancher. Yeah, cattle owner. Nineteen seventeen. Let's talk about your story. Like, where where did you guys get started off in cattle ranching? Thank you for that, by the way. Of course, because I'm going to tear that up tonight. Yeah. That's the kids will destroy that. There you go. Um, walk me through uh, how you came about into a i assume family business uh the wife's family business wife's family business. yeah so Even if, better. You're gonna, if you're gonna get married be the ugly one and yeah. marry up always I, up i knocked that out of the park awesome so my wife kara uh who's i don't i don't think she's met andy yet um she's met paul sharp and a bunch of those guys yeah we've, we've intersected a lot uh her family founded the double slash n ranch in 1913 Oh, wow. And after living there for four years as part of the Enlarged Homestead Act, they got deed to the first half section of land uh, in 1917. And yeah. that's when they got the double slash and brand from the state of Colorado. So that's the established brand is 1917. But they founded the ranch about a quarter mile from where we live today uh, in 1913. Wow. So 1860s uh, establishment Homestead Act. It was like getting people incentivized to push west. Mm hmm um what is it 160 up to 160 acres or well it's so five to well yeah so originally with the beginnings of the oregon trail it was 600 acres oh wow and that's where a lot of the farmers actually settled in iowa because they saw this really great black dirt that they'd never seen and they just mm. stopped and then all the poor schmucks of my family that ended up in oregon uh where i'm from they kept going until they got to oregon and were like man we should have stopped in iowa yeah and then in the middle, in the meantime, for the next 100 years you, or 50 years, you had people just passing through these prairie lands where, like Joe Rogan talks about uh, Empire of the Summer Moon, the yeah, book about book. the Comanches. Yeah. Uh, that's A lot of that takes place right where we're at. On the plains. Yeah, out yeah. on the eastern plains of Colorado. So after the uh, wagons and all of that, there was this push to fill in some of the middle gaps in the area. And so... Uh, the Enlarged Homestead Act that my wife's family utilized was a half section, so 320 acres. Wow. And today the family ranch is about 7,000 acres. Wow. So only 100 years to do it. No big deal. Wow. That's a big deal. I mean, uh, a lot of the original ranches, uh, even original brandings, are are closing down um, uh, by the year, yeah. uh, by the month. Um, and a lot of this has to do with this land – um, being handed down to generations, generations dying off, and then kids, grandkids, great great grandkids, just not having the interest, or the business model doesn't make sense. Sure. So they get upside down and they just sell it off. They partition it, right? They do. Or you can have a bad secession plan that, by law, it separates it among four family members, and only one family member really cared. 
Mm. Um, so there's a lot of that that happens, just bad planning, bad business management, and it ends up in the hands of a few people that maybe don't want any part of it. Yeah. Uh, Cor Blund actually has a great song about that called the S Lazy H. For anybody who wants to look up Cor Blund, uh, I know it makes my wife cry when she hears that song because it talks about breaking down a family ranch because the sister didn't want any part of it. And that sucks. Yeah. Well, and, and the hardest part, you know, to the business model conversation is agriculture since the 70s has just had the profitability wiped out. So in the 70s, for every dollar you put into ag, you could expect about $1.35 back. Decent you're margin. a businessman. That's an okay that's margin. margin. Yeah. It's 14 now. 14 cents. Cents. It's $1.14 for half. every dollar you put in. Oh, less than half. It's 40% left. And Insane. Well, and then how do you bring back another generation? How do you incentivize them to want to be a part of it when, man, you know, the patriarchs of the family may not have a retirement? Because your retirement really, a lot of times, especially if you're a cattle rancher or a farmer, you're not making a ton of money. You're paying the land payments and you're capturing appreciation on the real estate. Yeah. You're not really sitting on a pile of cash. Yeah. So when grandpa wants to retire, what do you do? Do you sell a section to give him liquid cash to retire does he stay on the ranch until he doesn't want to work anymore mm. how do you pay for some of that stuff and then if you know grandpa's going to be retiring and mom and dad are running the ranch how do you support a third family when you have a 40 percent profit margin from what you had 50 years ago how did you come about outside of um being married into it did you know that this is something that you're interested in or that you studied and then you're like Oh, I'm married into it. I'm, I'm marrying it up, and now I'm. This is the family business, or is this something that you know came about randomly? And you're like, oh, now I got to figure it out. Uh, so I, I would love to think that I had this really master plan. It certainly not anything that eloquent. Uh, grew up in Eastern Oregon. My dad was DOD SWAT at a chemical weapons facility. So, oh, oh yeah, he. It, you might have played at that range before. There's a tank range out there. It's yep. there's a big chemical weapons facility in Umatilla. They since shut down. Mm -hmm. So he was on the SRT graveyard team. Mm. So I mean, he went to FBI SWAT school, carried a gun for a living, and loved it. Yeah. Uh, mom owned a small real estate company in Pendleton, and I worked for other farmers. I, I worked on harvest crews. I worked in the mountains moving cows. Loved ag, uh, went to junior college in Pendleton, and then went to Colorado State University and said, man, I, I like money. I like ag. Got a degree in ag business. Oh, really cool. Yeah. And then uh, minors in finance and accounting. So I'm a bona fide spreadsheet nerd, mm. but I like to work with my hands and run equipment. So luckily, uh, it works out because I can build you a spreadsheet or I can go you know, use a skid steer and tear up your yard. <laughs> awesome. Uh after school, I actually went to work for Cargill, the big grain company. Mm -hmm. uh, I expected to go into the animal sector, but uh, that was in 05, and Cargill had the best offer. So I went and ran like export terminals for them uh, inland in Nebraska and Minnesota, loading trains that go to the ocean and get shipped overseas. So I was exposed to that market. Uh, went back to Oregon, ran a bunch of construction uh, projects for a few different people doing subdivisions or big you know, apartment remodels. Because I turned into a paperwork guy at Cargill, I got good at capital projects due to the paperwork intensity of corporate America. Mm. Uh, met Kara. She was living in Boise. Decided we were going to get serious. I was going to move to Boise, and I went to work for a company called the Bratney Company out of Iowa. Mm. And that was where I was able to put a lot of finance backing, a lot of construction management, and my ability to BS with the best of them into a corporate sales gig where I was the corporate salesperson for people like Land of Lakes and Coors and we did things like that. So then you start stacking this very rudimentary value chain of corn in the field to a boat that goes overseas and that's all you ever see to this production value chain with people like Coors or people that make tortillas like Masika down in Texas uh, or flour milling companies like Graincraft that's based out of Tennessee now, but they've got a big facility in Ogden that I mm. used to work with. And when you start putting all those together and then tie it back to the animal sector where I ended up, uh, I ended up with this weird skill set where I actually worked in private equity for a few years on the agricultural side because I have this blue collar knowledge of how trains move and how all the commodities function, how to work with operations guys, mm -hmm. uh, the equipment needed, the construction that needs to happen, but also the financial side of understanding how that all has to marry together to get a black number at the bottom of the sheet so you can pay people. Yeah. Uh, private equity 
did really well for a few years. And then the beef company we started in 2018, it started growing and just through natural attrition, I started taking that over. Mm. Uh, and since then we've added a couple more businesses. Uh, just recently we uh, did a joint venture to take over the feedlot that we use to finish our cattle at. So now we're doing that on a custom and commercial basis. Uh, so just, you know, like you guys, man, building an empire one step at a time. Yeah, it's 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 interesting because I'm always I'm always interested to hear the startup story of how guys our age got into business, and because it's general generationally a completely different perspective. Because you kind of we grew up analog, mm -hmm. but then we em, em, were immersed in technology through that progression. Mm -hmm. But we saw you know the dial up. Um, analog process is becoming digitized and now we're immersed in a technological world. So I think we are like the last, how old are you right now? 40. Yeah. So we're the same around the same age. We grew up in a state of transition. And so if we didn't shift and adapt our ways of thinking, um, which I think is advantageous in new business, especially in agriculture, then agriculture wouldn't be in the best position. Cause if we just depended on legacy ways, the good old days, the good old boys, all the business would be dead mm -hmm. because a lot of businesses that I see when I talk to, you know, uh, uh, Wasatch Wagyu, uh, when I talk to uh, Greg from Little Bell Cattle Co., these new ways of thinking, interoperating, building relationships at a grander scale, um, inter introducing technology, social media marketing and campaigning, all of these different things, e even the boxing where it's mm -hmm. like, hey, man, this is this could be a, a good e-commerce based business. If they're not adopting those tactics, they're failing, mm -hmm. and they're failing miserably. And you know, you can't blame the great grandkids who can make twice as much by moving into Boise, into the city, and working for a tech company, making that money when they'll go broke, especially if they're getting taxed to the land, which a lot of people are. Mm -hmm. I mean, I just got a five thousand dollar bill from Wasatch County and for, for my for just my for house, being here. just for being here. Right. I'm like, damn. Hey, y'all wanted to take a quick break from this podcast to let you know that one of our sponsors is Element, oftentimes mispronounced as L-M-N-T. It is an electrolyte company, and if you haven't heard anything about them yet, they are taking the science-backed electrolyte market by storm. Each little sachet of powder has 1,000 milligrams of sodium, 200 milligrams of potassium, and 60 milligrams of magnesium. Everything you need, nothing that you don't. That means no sugar, no junk, lots of salt. Lots of salt. You'll get used to the salt, don't worry. As a nurse, I've always understood the importance of electrolytes in our body. When you're doing any sort of natural processes, which happen on the daily in your body, whether you want it to or not, or you're expending energy through working out or chasing kids or just doing your basic job, you have to rehydrate with more than just water. You need hydration on the cellular level and electrolytes are the key that can unlock that for you. I can 100% tell when I don't take my electrolytes. It's something I take every single day, but when I'm working out, especially in the hot summer or the cold winter, when you get dehydrated the most, believe it or not, I notice a huge difference when I'm not taking my electrolytes. If you haven't tried electrolytes, I highly encourage you to do so. It is formulated to help anyone with their electrolyte needs. So even if you're doing keto or low carb or a paleo diet, you can use the element. It's great at helping to prevent and eliminate headaches, muscle cramps, and fatigue. Helps you with hormone regulation, nutrient absorption, and fluid balance in the body. My favorite flavor is orange salt. My kid's favorite flavor is watermelon salt. I think you'll love it. Give it a try. And if you go to drink lmnt.com slash fieldcraft, you'll get a free sample pack that's eight single serving packets free with any element order. It's a great way for you to try out all eight flavors or to share element with one of your friends. So visit drink element, drink lmnt.com slash fieldcraft. So let's talk about the scale and size of your cattle operation and your business uh let's talk about the business as it as it stands now like how did it evolve into what it is and and let's talk about what it is yeah so it started as a idea so kara actually uh 
was part of the CALP program in Colorado, Colorado Ag Leadership Program, sponsored by the Colorado State University, sponsored by Colorado Department of Agriculture. Hmm. And they had to have a project. And she always thought this was a good idea. And we had a conversation with her dad, who still runs the ranch itself. And we talked to him about succession planning. And he said, yeah, you guys, I think you guys could certainly take this over. And and I'm a business nerd. So I said, well, I understand just enough of your business model, Dave, to, you know, get it. Is that repeatable for another generation? And he said, no. Whoa. It's not that he's doing anything wrong. The market is shifting. It's getting more vertical. Uh, and, you know, we could spend an hour talking about what he does because he spent 50 years building a model based on his very specific skill set that's very, very profitable. But man, you couldn't download him unless you can pull a matrix on him and hook him up and download that knowledge. There's no way you're going to recreate it. Yeah. And Kara and I luckily both come from corporate sales. We come from business backgrounds. And we said, what can we do to minimize our input and maximize our return? Which sounds really sterile, but damn, it's business. Like you got to have a return. And if you think about the cattle space, a typical yearling operator, you know, buys weaned calves, keeps them at the ranch on grass and then sells them to a feedlot. That's what my father-in-law does in a nutshell. They'll tell you that $100 a a head a year, which is only a five-month working time frame, Mm. is what they hope to make. Hmm. Well, hell, if you're going to run 5,000, you're only going to make 500 grand, but you have to have $7 million in working capital out there. So your return on capital is like junk. I mean, it's it's sub 10%. Which, why would you want to do that? Yeah, why would you do that to yourself? Exactly. And your family. Yeah, and, and that's a hope to make 100. That doesn't mean you're going to. Yeah. The market doesn't say, yeah, you're always going to get 100. Just make this work, and that's your salary. That's not how it works. There's years you're in the red. Mm. So, you know, we said, man, where where do our skill sets lie? To drive the ranch into a price-making model instead of the price-taking model that my father-in-law is subject to. Mm. Because he has to take what the market is giving him. And you can hedge and you can buy options and puts and do different risk management tools like we do with the stock market and everything else. But it's still risk management. It's not risk mitigation. Yeah. And with us, it's like, man, if I have a connection to this customer, I know what they like. I can reach back out to them. Like at Fieldcraft, you guys probably have email marketing campaigns. You have all the things because you own that connection. Well, in the commercial cattle space, there is no connection to own. So we said, man, we got to create a different model. We don't want to be price takers because that just sounds like a lose-lose at some point. Like I like craps and shooting dice as much as the next guy, but sooner or later, (laughs) they're going to get you. So we took that. In 2017, we started the company. We did a ton of market research. And our theory was we know some other ranchers that grow beef that sell some here and there. Uh, Maybe it's, you know, coal calves or different things they can do to add value. We didn't want to play in that game. Uh, So we started on a bigger scale. Uh, We started with more cattle. We invested in a very high-end website to build that connection. Direct to consumer sales. 100%. Yeah. And and through the mail, through FedEx, it's all optimized. It's Mm -hmm. all through ShipStation and all the other software systems that – I love my brothers and sisters in agriculture, but not everybody wants to play like that. Which is interesting because they, they've shaken out a lot of the the issues and drama. Now mm-hmm. the user interface is like seamless. I mean, it's like it's it pretty easy. The hardest part for us though is the perishable side. Yeah, because FedEx doesn't guarantee delivery. They waste yeah. product. Like the year of COVID, we had like a five percent shrink rate. Oof. But the business tripled that year. Mm-hmm. Well, you can offset a five percent shrink rate if you're tripling your revenue. Mm. Uh, so luckily, we're fortunate enough to be in the right position at the right time. We had FedEx agreements in place pre-COVID, so our pricing was already locked, uh, and we'd optimized that system. We'd optimized how we ship, where we ship from, all the different pieces of that puzzle. So when that uh, societal event took place, we were prepared and able to you know, pivot and grow like we needed to. Uh, and, you know, 2018, we shipped our first beef. And for 2022, we're going to be probably 19 times the size we were in 2018. So if you're inclined to share this, because I'm trying to navigate this as, as a different, I get, it's interesting because the secession plan 
there's not many industries or spaces that need a secession plan mm -hmm. because there's not a lot of grandfathered um, legacy businesses that are dying like ranches and cattle and ag are dying. I, that's amazing. That's 100% amazing. I, I, I'm talking to an I personally want to have an orchard as part of my my setup, and I'm talking to two retired in their 80s hmm. who did orchard farming for 40 years, wow. who understand who did relationships with Dole early on, who got out of the business because they didn't want to adapt mm -hmm. because they wanted to retire. Right. But they could have secession planned and integrated in technology, and it could have been amazing. Mm -hmm. whether, whether it was direct to consumer sales, you know, advancing the the pro shop, or I say pro shop, but it's like a farmer's market tactics of bringing people in to pick. There's so many things that you could do. You came, your wife came up and you came up with that via a business plan uh, in the academic uh, sense, right? You came up with the actual structure of it. Yep. And then you executed it. Um, if you take a cow that, you went through a traditional um, legacy ranch and by the numbers versus your cow that's going direct to consumer through the mail uh, in your model, what's the multiple there? Where do we look at, like, is, is it a 4X over the, the standard cow? And, it, and do you look at it that way? Not necessarily, because from a risk management standpoint, we have a commercial market that those cattle could land in, right? Yeah. So... Let's just talk T-shirts. We'll make it really simple. Yeah, you can buy ten thousand of those next level T-shirts. You know the T-shirts everybody uses. Yep. Okay. Well, you can resell those. That's a known commodity. Mm -hmm. Well, if you overpay for them, or you overproduce your own T-shirt and you need to sell it at a lower price, you're you're extending too far. Mm -hmm. So the problem we run into in the direct to consumer beef space is a lot of times people are not as mindful of their financial position as I think they could be. Mm. And they don't keep themselves protected on the commercial market. Because our biggest issue is if we overproduce cattle, because mind you, if we want cattle six months from today, they go on feed in the next 30 to 60 days. You're projecting four or five months out on a commodity that has a known value that doesn't demand a premium. So you need to manage your risk in a way that you keep that throttled. Yeah. Um, and like Greg at Little Belt, he's doing a great job of that. I went up to Micah Fink's event last yeah. month and yeah. Greg and I had a cocktail up at the armory and I mean, great dude. Yeah. I thought he was taller, but I hope he <laughs> listens to this, shoots me a text message. But they need small seals to put in submarines. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it, insofar as a multiple on production, we are almost on par with our production costs. Um, is that because the foundation of the commercial cell is more secure in its position. Mm -hmm. And then the direct to consumer cell, it's like, we don't know the market might just tank. And then you're left off with leftover with all this beef. Mm -hmm. Well, and then the flip side of it is, is all your cuts have different values, right? Yeah. You know, a brisket's not worth as much as a ribeye, but then you have certain guys that charge $12 for a brisket and I charge eight. Mm. And then you have other guys that charge $14 for a ribeye and I charge 26. Oh. So you have the sliding scale on all these different values because once you turn that cow into meat, it's it's a different commodity. Mm. Um, so the bigger problem isn't necessarily the general multiple. It's how do you move all the product? Because there's a lot of people, you probably know some around here, that do half beef. Yeah. Sure. Well, the number of people that really want to buy a half an animal is pretty low. Mm -hmm. So you're minimizing your audience. You're mm -hmm. minimizing your market. So we sell smaller bundles. We have a griller box. We have a burger box. We have a comfort cooking box. We have a smoker box. We built all these different packages so people can buy the type of steaks they want for the most part. Mm. And we've built those in such an algorithmic way that as things start to get overstocked in the freezer, like we get high on burger, we can you know trip a lever in the email marketing and give a break on burger pricing to lower that inventory and keep everything flat. Uh. So from a multiple standpoint, I, I know it's taking me like five minutes to not answer your no, question. No, it's important. The context is important. <laughs> yeah. So from a multiple standpoint, that's not the biggest thing. It's the bigger thing is what do you do with all the inventory? Yeah. Because if the job was to sell all the ribeye you can make, we can all do it. But you also have short ribs. And can you make money selling liver? And can you make money selling heart? Mm -hmm. And some people don't like this cut. They only want that cut. So well, short ribs, the Koreans buy the liver and the heart. I think the Chinese are on board with that. that. 
Am I allowed to say that? Is that I, a, that's up to you, man. So your <laughs> your biggest issue is figuring out. Well, I find that interesting because there are such niche. Um, there are now niche small businesses that focus their attention on these very small uh, ag spaces that they can't get supply for. Mm-hmm. And then there's suppliers for you, or, or like you, who are looking for those commodities, for that commodity in that resource, but it needs to be consistent mm-hmm. because you can't gamble every time you, you flip a cow and then last minute try to find and source. Like liver and heart, um, who are those guys? They um, ancest- Ancestral? Or- oh, Ancestral Health. And Ancestral yeah. Health. Man, I actually took their supplement. It gets me bad heartburn. Mm-hmm. But I actually love it that I could take a pill form of liver. Mm-hmm. I just don't have the time or the, the you know. The palate. The palate. I have people ask me, how do you cook liver? I'm like, dude, I got I got like 30 head in the freezer at my yeah. house. I don't need to eat Lots liver. of ketchup. That's how you cook it. Um, uh, but but it's so healthy for you. But it's like the difficulty I, I could see is predicting that and forecasting that with success. Um and consistency across mm-hmm. the board, obviously. Well, and being able to move it. Yeah. Right? Like, yeah. Uh, so we've got a meat wholesaler in Denver that takes a lot of our offal, the organ meats. Um, I've got another Hispanic restaurant that takes most of the tongue. They do lengua tacos. Ooh. Yeah. Which are awesome. Great. Yeah. Um, Especially by the Mexicans who know how to prepare it the right way and make it delicious. That's right. Um, and then I've got a couple Is that outlets. racist? Is that Jose? Were you good there? Okay, he's good with it. He's good with that. Like, official. Well, it's, I mean, I've got, we've got uh, like Danny Vega. He's a health influencer. Yes. He's down out of Tampa. Good dude. Yeah. That guy loves language. He's a Cuban dude. Yeah. And he's like, I was like, I've never had really good language. He's like, you come to Tampa, I'll make you a taco. I was like, dude, that is an expensive ass taco. Yeah. But I'm going to figure it out. Like, yeah. we're going to get a nasty blizzard in March. I'm going to just show up on Danny's door and be like, what up, man? I hear some taco. With Here's the highest tongue. quality yeah. tongue. Yeah. yeah. Here. I'm going to go sit on the beach. Let me know when the stuff's ready. Dude, I love that, man. Yeah. Uh, so the big thing is, you know, we have like uh, double wide burgers in Fort Collins. It's a food truck. We do a custom grind for him and he does a fair amount of burger every month. Mm. So it's just building these value chains that move product out of the freezer because it's, it's resource management. Mm-hmm. It doesn't matter if you're kicking in doors overseas and you're like, man, how many birds do we have today? How many helicopters do we got? We got to take this many people. Well, we only have this many helicopters. There's a math problem. Yes. One of our biggest resources is cattle on feed space in the freezer how fast can you turn that space in the freezer to allow for new inventory Mm. and yet that lever can't be a question because there's a finite amount of freezer space Mm. i love see i love i love all this because i love it because there's so many proposed problems but so much creativity and room uh, for creating the the best solutions via your ecosystem right Mm -hmm. because it like uh greg at little belt is doing the food truck yeah, and but he's crushing. It, but it works for him specifically because he's in Bozeman, mm-hmm. where a whole bunch of people appreciate that kind of farm fresh food delivered to a food truck. And he has the problem of too much burger. How are we going to get? How are we going to move this burger? Yeah. And it just works. Same problem I had, yeah. right? We just figured out a the, kind of the same solution, just different levels of involvement. I, I love. I love that. How, how many head of cattle do you move at your ranch, the seven thousand acre ranch? So the family, uh, Kara's dad is going to be, you know, in the thousands yeah. on the commercial side. Yeah. Craft beef is a very small portion of that. So are you working the craft component of the, the overall? Uh, craft um, beef is strictly Kara and I. It's not, so awesome. It's not linked in the, com- in the commercial side. We help Dave. Uh, we do some work for him just, you know, because he comes and helps us when we have to gather cattle. It's a big handshake deal. And occasionally I have some bush light for him. And occasionally he has a bottle of whiskey for me. It works out fine. Love that. And, you know, it just depends on where the model goes, who needs help. And it's very much that handshake type environment that you want. You know, it's, hey, the, you know, John is one of our other neighbors. He lives five miles south of us. Well, when he's moving his cows and preg checking cows, we go help him. When Mm -hmm. we need help, we call him and he comes up like, and never have we ever exchanged money for any of it. Mm, I love that. Yeah. Well, it's go along to get along, man. Like there needs to be more people giving to society instead of wanting to take all the time are you guys taking over the cattle ranch from for the family business probably okay got it i mean dave is 66 he turned 66 last week and he's got a six-pack and he probably wants to run cattle until he can no longer do it and i'm not going to ask him because he's 66 and 
I still don't know if I could kick his kick his ass, and I've done jujitsu for three years. So yeah. I, I think that old man strength will come up. It'll be no good. Man, 66, 67, uh, 30 years ago would have been like a death sentence. Now it's like that you see dudes in their 60s and it's in 70s and they're prime. Mm -hmm. Man, I, I hung out with these two 80 year olds in Oregon and uh, outside of Portland, um, which uh, not a fan of Portland, but a fan of Southwest Portland actually was pretty nice mm -hmm. where I was at. So like and Beaverton area? Beaverton, yeah. yeah. So beautiful there. Uh, I was like, this is Portland? Um, but uh, they're in their 80s. They spent 40 years on an orchard farm. And they're living their best life retired. And, man, are they healthy as hell, mm -hmm. cognitive as all be. And I'm like, all right, there's there's something to this. I mean, whether it's extending your lifeline or just, you know, it's something that you could do for an extended period of time until you can't no more mm -hmm. and then hand it over to your kids, which is what I plan to do. Uh, it's just an amazing family tradition. I, I personally no longer want a cattle ranch mm -hmm. after spending time deep in the weeds of uh, talking to guys like you and, and Greg and some other friends because um, I don't want those problems. I, I realize never ending list of them. I, but I, what I do want to do is something like you're doing where it's focused on craft. Mm -hmm. Now I personally will have cattle. Like I got the steer in my, in my yard, which we'll talk about in a second, but I, I have a homestead idea mm -hmm. where, you know, all the things that I do from my chickens and ducks to goats for packing out for hunting elk, um, to the uh, orchard, mini orchard I have out back, to the steer I have in my yard, I want more sustainability in my own life and situation. Um, but I think I'm leaning on an orchard mm -hmm. versus cow, a little bit cleaner. I've got a, a great uh, data point on that because I know your your kids are about the same age as mine. Yeah, uh, We have a three-year-old and a one-year-old. Awesome. And a good buddy of mine actually that I talked to on the drive up here, uh, his name's Dawson. He's out of Spokane. We went to college together. And he and I were talking, and he goes, man, I've got to move out of town. He's got a little girl. She's 10, I think. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, I mean, you guys have the dogs and everything. He goes, there's no no lesson I can teach her that's as important as these animals depend on you when they're not your pet. Oh, man. I was like, that's – as a guy that's had horses and cows his whole life, more or less, and, you know, we had pigs growing up, I, man, that is a, a piece of data I'd never put together. Mm -hmm. He's like, yeah, they depend on you. Yeah, your dog depends on you, but they're your pal. Yeah. Like some of the cattle that depend on us have tried to run me the hell over, and yeah. I still have to make sure they eat. Yeah. There's a level of humility and education in that that you can't recreate. Mm -hmm. And that attachment, not just to nature and where your food comes from, but that attachment to a selfless nature is something I don't think a lot of people have. Yeah. And it ingrained in the kids, you could see it translate. I'm mean, not trained. At one, no, at 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 two, my kids were bottle feeding these little Nigerian goat. Man, these little guys, the dwarf goats. These little dwarfs are turds, mm -hmm. <laughs> but they're funny as hell. And when they were little, they were the right size. That I mean, my daughter at two was bottle feeding these guys, mm -hmm. and now she consistently. I put on my boat boots. She puts on her boots. She goes out there and she helps dad feed uh, the goats and the chickens and the ducks, and you could see a shift in her. Like she's, I mean, my son, he'll like throw them at him. He'll eat the cereal. Like he's eating bird feed and stuff. I'm like, what are you doing? Go play. But my daughter, the nurturing in her that comes out of that from trying to take care of animals and, and do stuff. It's not even about the damn, f I mean, the, the eggs are nice, mm -hmm. but it, more important, it's about the life lessons. Absolutely. I mean, you can't, you can't teach that any other way that I've found. Yeah. Uh, you know, our, our oldest, her name is Emma, and she loves her animals. Yeah. Like, she says goodnight to me, and she says goodnight to mom, and then she we have a livestock guardian dog outside of Big Pyrenees, and she walks to the door every night to say goodnight to him, and he meets her at the door. And I mean, I'm this thinking dog, about getting one of them. He's like 130 pounds. He's a yeah. monster, and if she beat on him with a hammer, he'd lay there and take it because that's just his kid. And yeah. I'm like, that's that's awesome. And we're fortunate enough to be able to share that with the girls. That's so awesome. Um, and they're good with kids. Pyrenees yeah. are like really good with kids. Yeah. Well, they're, they're good with their things. They're very, uh, yeah. accommodating to their stuff. Yeah. Um, but man, I, I, that Pyrenees has caught three coyotes, like ran them down. Now I think it's funny because where we live, it's brown most of the year. And if a big white dog runs you down in the middle of the prairie, you as a coyote probably don't have the best genetics. Like survival of the fittest means you're if a white cloud chases you down in the middle of the prairie, you you kind of deserved it. Yeah. 
Yeah, I imagine that wasn't a, a friendly encounter. It uh, it sounded vicious. Yeah, uh, I heard one. Did of they them. get away? I don't know. The white dog came back a shade of pink. Yeah, and uh, not a scratch on him. Of course. So I I didn't go searching. Yeah, I wasn't that worried about it. Yeah, but they're yeah. running sheep up here, up in uh, uh, the mountains above uh, my house, and I ran into them. I was joy riding in the back. And ran into a, a herd of them um, crossing the road, and the Pyrenees was acting as a crossing guard, mm. literally standing in the middle of the road, waiting for them to cross, and just was staring me down. And I've I've ran into Pyrenees shepherd dogs in Afghanistan on the middle of patrols Heck that have no. scared the hell out of me. We've yeah, had to kill right. we've had to kill a couple of them because they're so territorial towards their herd, and once they dial you in and they pack together. Um, that's you can a get a real murdered. problem. It's a real problem. Yeah. And a damn gun is the only thing that could put them down. And even a five, five, six at that point, you better be, uh, better be touching off more than one or two rounds. Oh yeah. They're violent. So. Um, let me ask you about this. Cause I, I, I am still trying to wrap my head around this and I want people to kind of get a sense for this. Uh, I've talked to Greg about this and some other friends and I'm experiencing a little bit with the steer that I got. So Wasuch, uh, Wasuch, uh, Wasatch. She just moved here. (laughs) Wasatch uh, County was where I live in, which has a lot of uh, Native American history, Mm -hmm. a lot of uh, 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 colonial pioneering of the uh, of the Mormons. Great, uh, great history at the center focal point through this whole valley of um, a great American history. Um, When I when I talk to Wasatch Wegu, my buddy Greg is like, "Hey, I heard you're interested in cattle." I have a Wagyu because I eat way. The only Wagyu I eat is local Wagyu. Mm-hmm. I eat it from the chop shop in Park City who, who sources locally. And I eat from Wasatch Wagyu. And I can't do too much Wagyu because it's too rich for me. Mm-hmm. But once a month, a couple times a month, we'll, we'll do something. And um, I said, yeah, I, I'm looking for cattle. What do you got? And he goes, oh, I got a Wagyu steer. And I'm like, that's perfect, man. How much for the Wagyu steer? He goes, well, I'll, because we're, you know, Helping each other out, we we help each other out all the time. Um, I'll I'll let you get one. Mm-hmm. Like Greg, that means a lot to me. Thank you so much, man. Um, l- let's get it dropped off. So it shows up and it's six months old, mm-hmm. and I'm thinking a baby. I'm thinking the size of this table at a minimum. Mm-hmm. Like it's gonna be the size of this table. Um, I've seen calves, I've seen uh, steers that are about six months old, and I expect it to be 500 pounds. Mm-hmm. And it shows up at 1,100 pounds. And he's about as big as my truck mm-hmm. <laughs> upstairs. Yeah, he's pretty tall. And he's tall. Yeah. And and he's wiry, mm-hmm. right? Because he's young. Well, because he's Wagyu. That's, that's he's their wa- nature. Yeah. That's how they're built. And he just got, basically just got weaned off his mama and and the pack, there, which is a big herd mentality mm-hmm. in him. Right. Um, which is sad to see because you could tell he's very sociable, wants mm-hmm. to be around people, or wants to be around his uh, animals. Puts him in my yard. And then I start doing local... Well, one, I have to give him a half a bale in the morning, mm-hmm. half a bale in the afternoon for winter feed, get mm-hmm. his fat content up, yep. keep him fat and marbly. I think it's, what, a couple pounds a week he needs to be gaining. Does no, that make sense? No, usually it's like two pounds a day. That's it, sorry. Two to three pounds a day mm-hmm. is what he needs to be gaining. Um, and that is expensive. By all estimates, at 20 pounds a bale, you're looking at 16 grand for 18 months of life. Uh, 10 pounds of bale, half that. We found a 10-pound of ba- bale because we're in bale country. Mm-hmm. This whole valley is full of, of good hay, good uh, grass. Well, the good news is my wife has a master's degree in cow nutrition. Oh, I'll hook her up with you and I'd see if that. we can minimize your, yeah, your five-figure feed bill. Yeah, and he said there's different tactics and grain. I mean, you got to finish them a certain mm-hmm. way, uh, which they're very particular. John, um, my South Korean Navy SEAL media director, said he knows the massage techniques because in Korea they do massages on Wagubi. Nice. He's going to hook that. Apparently you get on the back of them and you got to massage them for eight seconds before they get bucked off. Is that the rule? That's the you rule. you got to do one forward, one backwards, though? Yes. Yes. In Korea. Only in Korea, though. Okay. Um, does, does the backwards extra? Yes. Okay. It's a bonus. Okay. Um, and you add extra on profit on that. Right. Um, I don't understand the math on cows. A de- cow math does not make sense to me. Mm-hmm. And even when Greg tells me, I'm like, but you're not making money. Mm-hmm. I don't understand. Why are cattle ranchers still using traditional means? Is it because of the subsidy? Is it because of these variables? Like, help me understand cow math because I don't understand it. 
Sure. So the easy answer is on the cow side, there's almost no subsidies. So we can oh. throw that some bitch out the window. Interesting. Uh, you may, if you're a farmer feeder that has cows and farming, you may have some subsidies on the corn pricing and some of those things where yeah. you can offset that to a degree. Is there land subsidy as well if you're... Uh on the cattle side, yeah, you can do drought protection. Yeah, you can do some of that, but it's minimal. I mean, you're talking thousand bucks a section. So you're not getting any substantial subsidies. No, uh, the biggest subsidy I've heard of recently, uh, like in 2014, there was a big drought in North Dakota, mm-hmm. and they had to offload a ton of cows out of that area. So it's a mother cow area because there's different verticals in the cattle space. So that's a big cow calf area in like some preposterous number, like 40% of the cow herd was sold out of North Dakota because they had no feed. Mm. Well, the federal government stepped in, declared it a disaster. And the only thing they did is they offset their taxes on that uh, revenue for 12 months. So they increased their feed. They offset the taxes on the feed? No, no. They had to sell them other cows because they had no feed. Oh, okay. Got, they, yeah, they're getting they, rid of them. And they gave them tax deferment for 12 months. So if they bought back the cows within 12 months, they didn't pay taxes on the money they got to sell the cows originally. That is the most I've ever heard of in strictly the cattle space. Mm-hmm. Uh, and there was a little bit of stuff during COVID because uh, the commercial processors all shut down. Like And, and by shut down, well, we'll talk that math in a second. Uh, they the government kicked back some COVID relief money because it detonated the market. It went from like a dollar thirty a pound to a dollar a pound overnight when people were sitting on, you know, the commercial level of cattle that are needed to keep the country fed. Uh, Cause that's one of the things subsidies get a bad rap, but you know, you've been overseas. What's the biggest thing that people are fighting over usually territory and food. Mm. Well, the government us- utilizes our ability to produce food for, international and national security interests. They will provide boatloads of X commodity or rice or something, you know, like during uh, Black Hawk Down, Mogadishu. Like the UN was bringing in rice and other food for the locals, like the refugees. That's a big part of it. So some of the subsidies exist to keep a certain level of production that our country can utilize for international and national security interests. Mm. So without peeling that onion back a whole lot, because I don't know much more than that about it. We have to be careful when we start saying you shouldn't support things because like Turkey produces a ton of textiles. So does India. Well, they don't grow a lot of cotton. So a lot of the cotton comes from the U S to make all that. It's a mutual benefiting relationship. Absolutely. And it, and it keeps regions stable. Mm -hmm. So we have to look at the third, fourth to 10th level effects of some of these micro decisions we can make here that might pop something off elsewhere. Uh, so if we think about the cattle industry, we kill 660,000 head of cattle a week in this country, weekly. During COVID, when everybody said we were shut down, the lowest we got to was 440. We we're still almost half a million cows a week. So when some PETA guy right now is like, <laughs> his head just broke it out. Oh, it's well, it's like three million. No, it's 35 million pigs annually. And it's how many? Three? No, no. Excuse me. It's thirty-five million cows. It's like two hundred million pigs, and two billion chickens. I just watched Charlotte's Web with my kids last night. Don't do that. <laughs> and then I ate bacon this morning. So there you so go. We're back in. Back so on track. so we have to think about all these things and just take the cattle market for instance. You know, we're killing thirty-five million head a year in this country, around six hundred and fifty thousand a week. That market is controlled by. 85% of that market is controlled by four companies. So when you say, why do cattle ranchers do it? It's because there's a machine down there that's demanding product. Yeah. And that machine is being, It's a guarantee. Absolutely. Yeah. And that's where the commercial cattle space exists. That's why somebody's okay making 50 or $100 an animal because they can grow them at scale. Are they making that profit? Like when I'm, when I'm trying to... Like some of the cow math that I've heard, the feed... They're not making; they're losing money, kind of month to month, mm-hmm. in some of the, the the equations I've seen. There absolutely can be that. Okay. Um, there's two ways to look at it. I, I, excuse me. I'll say there's three ways to look at it. There's some people that are very progressive, very nimble. Uh, they've got different operational abilities within the market, so mm-hmm. they can keep yearlings and make them fat cattle to hit a different market. Some people can't do that because of sheer capital constraints. If you have 100 cows, it's 150 grand a day. That's a lot of money. Mm. 
uh, there's some people that do it the way grandpa did. And grandpa and the four generations before them granted them a ton of equity in a, in a big piece of real estate that's a farm or a ranch or something. And the bank will loan on that as long as you have equity. And they will claw that equity away time over time over time. And you get these very non-progressive ag operators that at some point end up selling back to the bank or selling the farm because they ran it to the point they can no longer get financed by the bank. And the bank owns it. Well, they'll sell it. I mean, oh, mostly they'll, they'll sell it. They'll, yeah. It'll be a distressed For the land. sale. Yeah. Hey, y'all. We wanted to take a quick break to let you know that this show is sponsored by Better Help. That's B E T T E R H E L P dot com. Your mind is one of the most powerful tools and valuable assets that you can have. Keeping it sharp is so important. There's no shame in needing someone licensed and ready to navigate your mind with you. Life's challenges can be tricky. And just having clarity and having someone to express your concerns and whatever those coping skills are too, and have them clarify that you're moving in the right direction can make all the difference. What BetterHelp has done is they've connected over 3 million people with licensed therapists. Super convenient, super easy, accessible anywhere, 100% online, and totally private. And guess what? If you don't like the therapist you've connected with, you just move on to the next one. So you still get to be in the driver's seat. You still get to be in control, but BetterHelp does all of the vetting for you, and they keep everything secure, and they make it so convenient. Right now, if you visit betterhelp.com, B-E-T-T-E-R-H-E-L-P.com slash fieldcraft, the benefit code to get 10% off for being a fieldcraft community member will automatically be applied at checkout. So visit that website today. Let's get back to the show. So that's when you see some of this ag consolidation. It's not necessarily that somebody doesn't want to do it. Usually there's somebody that wants to do it. It's that some people are bad at it. And some people end up having to sell because they've bled so much equity, they can't get financed anymore. Um, so the difference becomes, are people good business people? Are they good ranchers? Are they good business people and good ranchers? Because that's a whole other thing, right? Like, uh, you know, I know a fair number of people in the shooting training world, you know, like Mickey with Carry Trainer, we, mm -hmm. we're good buddies. Yeah. Some of the people in the shooting sports world run a great business. Some people are great at social media. Very few people do what you guys do. Yeah. Like you and Mickey, where you have content, you have legitimate training classes that are constantly full. Like there's just a different level. Yeah. But yeah. you can go to any town in any place USA and find a guy that says shooting instructor. Yep. You know, he's an IPSA guy. He's a NRA instructor. He's a whatever. There's just different levels to all this stuff. Mm -hmm. And the hard part is for the ag guys in particular, like if we take feedlots, for instance, people will really hammer on feedlots and they say feedlots are bad. Feedlots are this. Well, I'll tell you that if you're a hundred thousand head feed yard in Eastern Colorado and you're feeding that many cows a day, the systems you have to have in place to operate efficiently, to make money, to take care of all the animals are top notch because you have a budget, right? Mm -hmm. If you're a 3000 head feed yard on somebody's farm, that's really not regulated and not really seen by the public and it's not on the radar, it may not have as good of practices as some of the big ones. Mm. So there's this scale of economy thing that everybody loves the romance of the small rancher. Mm -hmm. And I am a small rancher. Yeah, Greg's a small rancher by, by comparative scale to yeah. some of the players out there. The commercial guys. Yeah. But there's a romance around it. But you have to do things so well as a, at a small scale to make money. Like when you guys started Fieldcraft, right? Like, I'll bet you were watching some of those curves going, we got to adjust that curve because we're getting near the bottom, right? Yeah, yeah. As you grow and you have to have working capital and you have to do all these different things and now do that with a biological entity. With all the variables. Yeah. Yeah. Do that with an entity that doesn't, you know, if you don't sell t-shirts, that sucks. You have inventory carry, but the t-shirt doesn't die. <laughs> yeah. If you have fat cattle and you don't move them, they can die. Mm -hmm. And there's no 
recourse. There's nothing to get back. You can't really insure them. Mm-hmm. Um, so as we dial into ag, whether it's farming or orchards or wineries or any sort of other agriculture, all those business com- components come in. And then you throw in this biological mother nature variability that's just insane and unpredictable. Mm. Weather, yeah. everything. Well, it's snowing today, yeah. right? Uh, it was, I think it was 2012. There was a nasty blizzard like the 15th of November or 15th of October in like Rapid City, South Dakota, like five, 10 years ago. And it killed like 60,000 cows. And then the insurance companies used to insure cows on pasture against freezing. Well, that was such a huge loss. They changed all the language. You no longer can get that coverage nationwide. <laughs> so, of course. Yeah, of course. And so as a, as a rancher, you're like, I've got my stuff mitigated and you're in, you know, Oklahoma or wherever. Well, Hartford Insurance or whoever it is nationwide took that language out because they took such a beating on one weather event. Mm. And now that risk mitigation factor is gone. And that's happening across the ag space, whether you're in farming or ranching or any sort of production. Regulatory risk, insurance risk, financial risk, government regulations, banking regulations, it's all getting tighter and tighter and tighter. So if you're not a higher end operator that's hitting above that 14% average profitability, you're probably going to be out of business if you're not careful. When, when you, when you look at how, um, I, I don't know the, the statistics on how many businesses are going out of business. I don't know if we know how many ranches are, are like going away. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I don't know if we're in a scarcity where, you know, there's a specific window where we go, if if we don't have these cattle ranchers, these big commercial operations still in business, it affects the food supply. But I know there's a lot of talk about, man, it's a fragile system. Mm-hmm. It only takes a couple things specifically to kind of put us in a bad situation. What's your opinion on, you know, are, is there any resilience built into the system? Are we hanging on by a thread are we able to get through a major catastrophe, a nuclear war with Russia, whatever it may be that's going to cause these economic and then national security issues? Are we on the precipice of this? Are, are we on? And are we on, are we on fragile ground? To a degree. So the one thing I would say is, in all the years of agricultural tracking and real estate movement, I've never seen a pasture go unutilized for a year. I mean, if one of our neighboring pastures isn't utilized and we're like, hey, why is that piece of real estate not have cattle on it? We start asking questions. You know who your neighbors are because there's a shortage of ground everywhere. Yeah. I mean, if you're farming in Iowa and there's a field not planted and you're going, hey, why is that field not planted? Is there an opportunity? So luckily in the commercial ag space, the capitalistic system works Mm. because if we start to see cattle numbers come down, the prices come up. That's what we see right now. Actually, cattle cattle prices right now are at an all-time high since we started Colorado Craft Beef. So the good news is we've gained a ton of scale of economy coming into this, so we've been able to keep our beef prices flat since 2019. Who causes the fluctuation of those prices? Well, it's the traded. The demand? Yeah, well, it's traded on the Board of Trade, right? So there's the Chicago Board of Trade, and the, or, yeah, Chicago Board of Trade and the uh, Chicago Mercantile Exchange, CME. This is government entities? No, they're private, yeah. but it's, it's similar to the stock market. Yeah. just like that. So you can go you can go sell corn and buy it back in a week and capture the difference if the market went down or you owe a margin call the other way. It's just like buying options in the stock market. Yeah. So that's a risk management tool we can use in cattle. Uh, you can minimize your feed risk by buying corn if you own cows. Like there's things you can do. Yeah. But obviously it all takes cash outlay. Mm-hmm. And if you sell one contract at calves, it's 50,000 pounds. So some people don't even have that. That's a semi load. Uh, so you've got to work through some of those weird mathematics, but it is supply and demand. It's all the market drivers and it's just cattle trading. It trades just like a commodity, just like gold, just like silver. You know, people move to gold when currency is in danger. Um, when the big swine flu hit in uh, China, like what, two years ago, I think they had to slaughter like two or three million hogs or mm-hmm. dumped them in the ocean or something silly like that. The beef market went up mm. because they're like, well, there's not going to be enough pork. Demand for beef and chicken is going to go up. So that drives the price up. Same kind of economic drivers. Mm. Um, so as the cattle herd comes down, because there's natural cycles, 
Um, as we have good weather, people keep more heifers, they grow their herds, and then you get a drought and you have to sell some off and the cattle numbers come down like they did in the last two years and you hit a high in the market. And probably next year, heifer and cow prices are going to be high and you, if you own a bunch of them, you're probably going to make a ton of money and people are going to overpay for those to rebuild their herd. And we're going to start the cycle all over again. It takes about eight to 10 years. The last high of the market was 2014. Oh, wow. So, but pretty much stable. Yeah. I mean, there's year to year. I, I was on a podcast a couple of weeks ago and I think the comment, I, I thought through it and I said, I think there's been six to seven major events in the last decade. Yeah. So it's usually there's an issue, you know, a harvest facility burns down and now everybody's worried there's too many cows and the price falls overnight. And so you have to mean, you have to manage your risk or you have to do like we've done at Colorado craft beef and controlled our market and controlled our customers and our prices don't really change. Mm. Cattle prices may change. We manage our stuff so that our customers know what to expect. We have the same type of cattle going through the same processing facility to get into a box. It comes the same way every time. So where you know that it's a little more money, and sometimes it's not actually with the way beef prices are right now, mm-hmm. um, it's a known. So to your point about, you know, can we survive some sort of nuclear war with somebody? I don't know about all that because that's a... We could probably have a whole other podcast just on what we think with that. But like you mentioned, the system is fragile, whether you want lettuce or if you want pork or you want bacon. And it was, I think it was like 2021, we'd had like the fourth big supply chain disruption. And on our social media, on Instagram, we said, this is the fourth major supply chain disruption in 18 months. Mm. If you don't have a freezer at home that has some beef in it, you don't have a couple cases of water. Fill it. Yeah, if you don't have that, what are you waiting for? Yeah. Use your head. Like, yeah. you know, where we live, I have a generator. It's a, it's a welder, but but it's we have the house wired up so I can stab the generator together. And we can have power because we're literally at the end of the power line. Mm. You know, be thoughtful. Think things through. Like the diaper shortage. Well, if you have a six-month-old, you're probably going to need diapers for another year. Mm-hmm. If you've got the extra cash, which not everybody does, I don't want to, you know, go out on that limb but if you've got the extra cash, yeah but if you're paying for netflix if you're paying for your itunes your music uh-huh. apps or, like all these guys are like oh it's expensive it's like is it really yeah. because if you just stop drinking starbucks every day for five dollars a latte yeah. then you might actually have enough money to i don't know stock your freezer exactly yeah and and if you stock that freezer you know maybe you can't buy a whole beef maybe you just buy some burger and you know you have a week or two worth of frozen food. Well, now do you buy a little Honda generator that can run a 110 freezer? And, you know, check your amp draw. Like, pay attention. Mm. I mean, it's out there. It's able to be taken care of. And, you know, the thing I say to people is, well, if you're not worrying about yourself, nobody is. Yeah, nobody's coming. No. It's all on you. Um, let's let's wrap up with um, – I kind of want to talk about your offering. Um, when I think about, like, your situation – wouldn't it be easier just to buy the cows or the cattle to um, supply your proposed demand versus a risk of having too much cattle and then you know going to market with maybe too less or too much? Because I know there's a processing component, which is mm-hmm. another story. It's another podcast by itself. Uh, uh, I talked with Greg about this on on our podcast together, which seems like a big issue. I mean, processing mm-hmm. is a huge, significant issue and a very expensive thing to get into to insource. Like, it's almost impossible to insource. Yeah. Um, are you doing a model of buying from other cattle ranchers, including your own family? Or do you start out with like a hundred head and then go to market through your offerings direct to consumer with whatever that is? So to date, we've done everything in house. Yeah. So we have we've scaled, we've grown, we've reinvested, and now we're to a point that because the bigger issue is can you feed a whole pen? Mm-hmm. I mean, I can't incentivize somebody to grow me twenty animals. It just doesn't make sense. I might yeah. as well have them in my fold. Uh, so luckily, we're to a scale now. Uh, that we've got a couple partner ranches that we work with that we will likely be starting to contract cattle with other known ranches to tell the story of other ranchers. So cool. Well, the famine mindset, dude, we got to get rid of that. Yeah. Like agriculture is nasty for it. I mean, I've heard you and Andy talk about uh, the famine mindset about the mission set, you know, going into OIF one. And then by the end of the, by the end of, you know, 20 years, you're like, 
I'm cool. You guys want that? You go nuts. Good. Yeah. And it, in ag, everybody is so worried that you're going to take a customer. You're going to yeah. take a market. You're because, uh, well, well, excuse me to say this, but rightly so. Profitabilities went from 35 percent to 14. That's a trend everybody can feel. Yeah. It's very, very emotional. And a lot of this stuff, uh, you know, I said it on Andy's podcast when I was on there last year. You know, you guys go through a door and one of your teammates takes a hit. It's the worst. Yeah. That's a legacy component. It's an ownership of the rest of the team. It's all of those things. And now I look at my wife and I say, for four generations, her family's figured this out. Mm -hmm. She doesn't want it to fall apart on her watch. Mm. Man, that legacy piece for her, it's its palpable. Yeah. It's, it's so emotional. And I don't mean that in a bad way because it is a love of it that makes you do it. Like you don't pass cows yeah. when it's 20 below and love it. It sucks. It sucks. You can have Gore-Tex, you can have all the shit, and it still sucks. But you do it because you love it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's like you go on missions with the same dudes for the dudes, right? It's, yeah. We do it for the legacy. We do it for the family. We do it for the love of our fellow ranchers. And, to be able to tell the story of some of our brothers and sisters in ag in a way that keeps everybody profitable mm -hmm. uh, is something we look forward to being able to do. That's unfortunate because it's, in my eyes, the only way they will survive is if they open their eyes to diversifying in a different way. It's mm -hmm. just different. You know, a lot of ranchers, that I, a lot of cowboys that I talk to, like – if you're a cowboy and you've hashtag cowboy, you're likely not a cowboy. Because if you're an actual cowboy, you're too damn busy cowboying and working and earning a living to be on social media talking about your cowboy days. Mm -hmm. Most ranchers um, who grow up in that industry and space, who were handed down these generational family businesses, um, they have a disinterest in social media, mostly. Um, and when you see them, uh, they're working. They're in the combine. They're in the... They're on, they're on in the fields. They're working the cattle, and so to have an opportunity to have somebody who's kind of made these trans transitions between analog and technological advance uh, advances in our society is a gift, I think. And if you educate them, I, I think they're going to be on board, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, that, a lot of it takes education, but when you show them, it's not like a scary thing. It's like Hey man, we want a lot of these ranches with a lot of these original brands that were issued in the 18 and 1900s. Holy crap! Why aren't they popular on social media? That's mm -hmm. that's the popular brands I want to identify with because that's deeply seated in American culture. I've got a I've got a marketing piece for you there. Yeah, I had a buddy of mine tell me why that is. Huh? Because so many of these guys with these legacy pieces want to be the hero of their own story. They don't want to make the customer the hero of the story. Interesting. Uh, that's a tough one because you, I see a lot of the ranchers are like, I'm doing it this way because I'm right. And they do it in a, I don't want to say a confrontational tone, but a very intensive, like self-valuing yeah. tone. They're dickheads. A lot of them are dickheads. Kind of. Well, because yeah. because they feel like they have to defend themselves. Yeah. And there's, I know people in the ag industry are like, I want to fly under the radar. I want to this. I want to that. I'm like, so you want to be further from the customer that already isn't connected to you? Like, yeah. I get it, but damn, you're not helping yourself. Yeah. Uh, Greg from Little Belt Cattle Co. talked about this, and he talked about in the conversation of trying to broker engagements and build relationships with local uh, surrounding ranchers mm -hmm. and how some of them were okay, but a lot of them were real resistant. Oh, yeah. And, and they didn't want to – if you asked them a question like, so what are you doing for numbers? And they, they're like, that's like asking me uh, – you know, who about my wife, you know, it's like, well, I'm not, I'm not actually asking about your wife. That's a different thing. I'm actually asking about your business because I want to help you. Mm -hmm. or I want to partner. I, I think once we get past that, when you have businesses succeeding the way that you do and bringing them into the fold to tell that story, that's impactful. And, you know, whatever we could do to support that, well, the that's C word, The C me. word is a dangerous one, Mike. What's the C word? Change. Oh, yeah. Change is a, change is a dangerous thing. And yeah. people in ag... They, they own what they do to a level that it can it is beyond reproach. Yeah, it's uh, their persona, it's their identity, it's their purpose, yeah. Yeah. and any change of that is a personal attack potentially. Yeah, to where change. where a true entrepreneur, I'm like, oh, you don't like that? Tell me more. Yeah, I, you're not going to hurt my feelings. Maybe I'm not seeing it right. 
share with me what you think. Like I do some business consulting and some mentoring and coaching. That's awesome. And when people ask me, they're like, well, th I didn't like how this felt. I'm like, why? Do you have something to hide? Is there something truly wrong? Or is it an opportunity to better yourself? And you grab hold of that thing and say, is it really wrong? Yeah. And now you have to be honest with yourself, which is the scariest part of life. Yeah. Especially when you operate in your own domain and not having to be confronted with that realization. Yeah. Um, it's either that or die. I mean, that's that's the honest thing here. One of the reasons why I personally am invested in this because my favorite people in the world are ranchers and farmers. And I want, I, I understand the foundation that it is for feeding the country, but we meet, need people like Jeff. We need people like Greg. We need people like uh, the other Greg from uh, Wasatchewagu to diversify and expand on this because if not, uh, we're going to be, I mean, you're going to see government entities owning cattle ranches and farming institutions because um, you have to insource it for the sake of national security because we're not being creative enough in the business space. Well, and, the biggest yeah. landowner in the Western U.S. is the federal government. Yeah. I mean, there's yeah. that's a whole other podcast. Yeah, it's like we could do like part podcasts. 74 by the time we're done talking about that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Jeff, where can people find all your offerings um, online? And, and what are some of the things that you're offering right now? Yeah. Uh, so we're, of course, going into the holidays. So we do a ton of holiday business. Uh, a lot of the sa summer sausage boxes, we can do customized commercial gifts. So like mm -hmm. our bank will order a couple hundred boxes and those will all go out customized for individual customers. Uh, we can put in other things like we've had people send us beer koozies with their logo to go out with boxes to certain people. Uh, and then, you know, we have subscriptions. We have single one-off boxes. Uh, we're pretty mellow. If there's something on the website you don't know works or you want to do something different, uh, just shoot us an email. Like the phone number on the website goes into a cell phone that's in that backpack. Mm. Um, we're still very connected. We have two employees, uh, one of which is our marketing guy who's a Marine machine gunner. <laughs> he's a saw, the best marketing he's a guy. saw gunner, but I, best marketing guy ever because he calls me. He's like, I don't like this. Can I change it? I'm like, do you? And he hangs up. It's awesome. It's like a radio call. Yeah, he didn't even say bye. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, you can find everything on coloradocraftbeef.com um, or Colorado Craft Beef on all the socials. Um, on the mentoring and business coaching side, you can reach out to me through that. Um, I've got my own Instagram, but it's pretty minimal. Okay. So we're just, we're kind of an open book, you know. I Reach out it, if you got any questions. I love it, man. Jeff, I appreciate you. Oh, thanks for having me, dude. Appreciate yeah. it. Yeah. Support your local American-made businesses as well as uh, your local ranchers and farmers. Um, I learned a lot on this podcast. I hope you guys learned a lot. If you're listening to this on YouTube, make sure you hit the subscription and notification tab so you can get alerted to the next video and spread the wealth of network um, because the more ears and eyes that get on this stuff, uh, the better informed we'll be. You know, food is the staple. One of the staples of survival that's important for a country. And if we want to be more resilient, we got to understand how this works. And please understand where your food comes from. I know uh, there's only a few uh, elements of food that exist in my freezer because I feel only feed. I don't feed my family from Walmart. No, uh, no offense to Walmart, but it's coming from um, Jeff's place. It's coming from uh, the hunting that I do seasonally. Uh, and it's going to come from uh, guys like Wegu or Wasatch Wegu. Uh, and that's it. Uh, I want to know exactly where my food comes from, and so should you. Till next time. Thanks, bro. Thanks, guys. Thanks.